Hello, everybody. You've got James Miller here, and I am um, really excited to be welcoming a couple of great guests to talk about the brave new connected world. Um, there's been a lot of talk with regard to Internet of Things over the last few years, and I think we've got some really good perspectives on how that's going to change your, your lives and how you go to market um, over this year and um, the, probably the next decade or so. So first, I'd like to um, thank you for joining us, and I want to introduce our speakers. And so we have Christopher from Read Write. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief and has a very interesting perspective on um, moving from B to B to B to C to B to E. And so I think we'll learn about that today, and I'm excited to hear his perspective on that. And then Aria, one of my colleagues, is really going to talk about how to bring that uh, to life through your their media and your marketing technologies. Um, so I won't waste any time sort of introducing uh, myself, but I'll just say that I've been in business for 20 years, and I've never been um, in a time where it's so exciting to be involved in media and marketing. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Christopher. Well, thanks, James. I appreciate it. Uh, as you mentioned, I am the editor-in-chief of ReadWrite. And ReadWrite is the leading media platform for IoT in the connected world. And we've gone through a transition over the last 90 days uh, to really focus our editorial and our audience on IoT in the connected world. And the reason we did that is everyone can agree we are at the early days of IoT in the connected world. And yet today, business leaders and technologists and CIOs and poor guys down in your IT department, they're being asked to make multi-year, multi-million dollar bets on this world of IoT in the connected world. And it's a very difficult thing to do. I had someone last week say that IoT in the connected world right now, it's like being handed a jigsaw puzzle box without the cover art on it. You know that somehow these things fit together, but you're not quite sure how. And what is really underpinning this confusion and the opportunity for PR people and ad agency people and content folks is to change the conversation to support these people as they try and drive to an informed decision about IoT in the connected world. And what really is happening, not just in technology, and we're all used to marketing and technology, but in traditional industries that have not had a big technology component are now finding the waves of IoT washing upon their business. And this is causing a lot of confusion. Uh, I was at the Samsung Developers Conference last week, and there was a company there. They've made uh, custom installer products for homes for 30 years, light switches and light racks and thermostats. And the vice president of marketing said to me, I feel like I went to bed one night and I was a product. And I woke up the next morning and I was a platform. And I don't know what that means. And these people are asking for help. Now, one of the things that we've done at ReadWrite, since we have over 5 million people we talk to every week in IoT and the kind of world, is we ask them. We did a reader survey that just ended last month. And we asked them, how many of you are planning to start an IoT project? And not surprisingly, over 60% of our audience is planning to start an IoT project in the next six months. That's great news. But we wanted a little bit more clarity on what that meant. So we dove deeper into that information. We asked people again, so if you're starting an IoT project, why? Is it big data? Is it analytics? Is it connecting to partners to create more revenue opportunities for your company? And surprisingly, it was none of the above. We found that the biggest response was 42% of our audience that are planning to start an IoT project are starting an IoT project to figure out IoT. And it's a great place for us as marketers, as PR professionals, as advertising folks, and as content providers. It's a great time for us to provide the content, the stories, the narratives, and the communities that can start to help these people who are faced with this. The problem and the reason that we are doing this webinar today is that the world that we are used to as marketers doesn't really make sense anymore. And 
I come out of a direct marketing world. And in my world, you're sort of one of two things. You are either B2B or you're B2C. And the problem with IoT and the connected world is they have blurred the lines between those two worlds. That in reality, to provide this content, to provide the narratives and the conversation, the community that will help people come to the decisions and gain the knowledge they need to make a decision, a business decision to move forward in IoT and the connected world, it's not B2B, it's not B2C. It's actually a combination of both. And what we're talking about today is something we call business to ecosystem, BDE. B so what does that mean? What is BDE? Well, it's a realization that like our poor friend at Samsung Developers Conference, we're not in a world of products anymore. We're in a world of platforms. And what that means is you have to touch not just people at different points in the sales cycle, but you actually have to touch four completely different groups in your marketing, in your content, and how you talk to the world around you. And that means you have to simultaneously support your products, your technology, your developers, your customers. You have to support all of these simultaneously in the market in order to create a thriving and sustainable ecosystem. And if you cannot create an ecosystem, you will perish in the world of IoT. And so the great thing about IoT is everything is going to be connected to you. The downside to IoT is everything is going to be connected to you. And unless you can talk to these four worlds simultaneously with your marketing, with your PR, and with your content strategies, you're not going to be able to engage in the conversations that people need to have to make business decisions. And those are conversations around data and security and privacy and how everything is impacting everything. And you have to be aware of that in today's world. So what we're going to talk about more, we're going to get into is not just this new world of business to ecosystem, but how do you do that? How do you implement that both to the outside world, but also internally within your own business lines? Uh, there's people now that are making business decisions in your company that affect marketing that are not in marketing. How we look at marketing to the outside world has to change internally as well as externally. And done correctly. What this means as you as an organization living in the world of ecosystems can tell a far more precise story because you're touching all of these. You have to be able to walk people in the traditional B2B world. You be able to talk about your technology. And you be able to talk about your technology in an unbiased way that will convince people to build communities around your technology. And from those, you can create developers. And developers can talk to your API and then fabulous, you have a support and a community and a bunch of enthusiasm around your product. But it's also the B2C world, right? You have to turn around and send this out into the channel, which means you create an ecosystem out there. I'm sitting right now talking to you from the floor of IoT world, and it is about GE working with Hitachi, working with Panasonic. And if you cannot find those partners, you get cut out of the channels. And if you get cut out of the channels, you can't talk to the consumer. So if you look at this entire thing, it's B2B plus B2C equals BDE. Done correctly. What that allows you to do is make your marketing more effective, more precise, and more pulled together. So what that means is now you can create a unified content platform. And with your marketing, with your PR, and your content partners, you can deliver messaging that is consistent for each one of those four groups and yet hangs together to tell the entire story of your reason for being, your ecosystem, and why it exists in the market. And done correctly, you can tell what people's business drivers are, you can tell who you need to have as your partners, and you'll need to understand what motivates developers to get engaged because the reality is success in the connected world means a media platform that is also connected across all these points. And, and Chris, um, when you and I discussed this a few months ago, I was – I hadn't heard the concept before, you know, B to E. I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? And um, so I was really excited as you articulated that um, your, your point of view. How now that you've sort of been out in the market um, for a few months now with with this new messaging and, and this new construct, how are one your your team, the editors and writers that, that you work with every day, as well as your readers, as well as sort of 
the, the brand that you engage with? How, how, how are they accepting and adopting this sort of language? Well, the funny thing is, uh, it was already there. People were already talking about an inability to take their traditional marketing and content and drive it into this new connected world. The problem was there, they hadn't really figured out a label to hang on. I know that sounds sort of cliche. Oh, great, it's a label, we've solved it. But to understand that you really have created this change in the market, it was one of these weird cases where as content people, we're normally used to trying to drag the consumers with us. In this case, the consumers and our audience were already there, and we actually had to catch up to them. Uh, so it was us that was bringing up the back of the bus this time. But the realization was we had to tailor our content, and we had to get, um, from an editorial messaging point of view, we had to get narrow and deep. Um, you know, we're used to doing uh, what I like to call high payload versus low payload marketing. Low payload marketing is I get one or two messages across and I can trigger a consumer interaction. I can say, tastes great, less filling, or three out of four dentists. But we're in a world of high payload marketing now, which means your content needs to be a little bit more narrow, but a little bit deeper. You need to get into the weeds of this topic a little bit more because people are craving this information. And they were craving it before we arrived on the scene. So we're playing catch up. But for instance, when I came on board at ReadWrite, we were producing 500 to 600 word articles. We're doing 1,000, 1,200, and 2,000 word articles now because our audience needs to get into the weeds to understand the implications of the connected world. I mean, a perfect example of the implications is that you have people at their houses and they got the latest security patch for their Linksys router and they made sure that the latest system upgrades were on all their laptops and they make sure that everyone was using strong passwords and they protected that network every way as a consumer they possibly could and then the kid comes home with a Wi-Fi Barbie with the unencrypted data and blows a big hole in your network. So it's so much harder and you need to understand stuff so much more but it's a great opportunity. We've seen time on site increase by almost 25% on raid rights since we came on board the new editorial team because people are willing to stick around and listen as an ability to create community and narratives around your technology and your products, there is more opportunity now to make people sit and listen to high payload marketing than there's ever been. And I've been doing technology marketing for almost 20 years. I've never had audiences sit and listen to very deep, introspective, impactful pieces of content to drive business decisions. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting because these these devices have just sort of come upon us, um, and they've been you know out there for for years and years. But all of a sudden, we've woken up to them. Um, and as, as you said, you know, we're all a bit behind the eight ball here, and trying to quickly get up the speed to ensure that we're consistently speaking to this ecosystem. Uh, and that we're able to continually add, add value, and it's now multi-level um, and much more integrated than, than, than it was, was before. Absolutely, and I think that that's part of the reason why we were very excited to do this webinar with DWA, because um, the ability to deploy this content and engage community is certainly something that we have started to see great success with. Um, but we also need to work with media partners who, to your point, from a data point of view and from station to get to get a channel's point of view, um, know how to take this and then turn around and deploy that on behalf of large corporate partners who need to have this conversation. We absolutely can provide the content, but in terms of the media plan and then understanding the data to drive that media plan to success, that's really the world of DWA. Yeah, and I think that's, that's that's a great point. And as as we sort of um, kind of move move on to to, to Ari, I'll, I'll 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 hand the ball over to you. I'd love to hear you introduce yourself, give people some of your background, uh, and then sort of tell us what it means when we're we're dealing with you know um, the, your go to market strategy, the marketing technology, the media uh, that you have to engage audiences with. Sure thing, James. Thanks. Um, and uh, appreciate the handover. Um, one, one thing I'd like to just touch on, uh, you know, just the subtle head of intent, and I think 
the, the, the word intense has kind of popped up into our lexicon only recently um, with you know the likes of Google using it, um, whereas six months to nine months ago, it was a question mark of what is this intent thing. And, um, you, you know, at the end of the day, we're really just trying to understand why people do things, you know, what, what is powering those decisions that they make. And the Internet of Things <clears throat> is really just expanding those engagement points that we can actually measure and measure down to the individual level. And so um, the, you know, from a practical application perspective, I think we need to be thinking about, okay, there's a whole bunch of new data that's going to come on board. Um, we look at this scene and, you know, the London tube. If you really think about it, you've got ATM machines there. You've got people going up and down, moving from place to place. You've got multiple retail facilities there. And if you just put in Wi-Fi, um, iBeacons, um, other uh, implementation to actually track individuals, you've got thousands and thousands of data points being generated in that space, not to mention how many people you know, today in that, in that scene would be wearing a wearable, a fitness wearable, or um, some kind of a smartwatch. So you know, there's all this new data being collected, and I think what we need to think about from a marketing perspective is what what is not just the big data, but what is the smart data? What do we need to be thinking about, and when is it going to be applicable? Um, I'd like to walk through a scenario here. Uh, we started off talking a little bit about you know, the connected home. And typically in the connected home, what we're looking at is sort of these items on the left side, so security, climate, lighting, blinds, audiovisual appliances, doors and windows. And once you have the connected home connected together, you're going to be connect, collecting this data over time, which begins telling you a story about the individuals that are in that home. Now, when you add in the frequency um, and velocity that different forms of transportation provide, um, plus the, whether it's Bluetooth or beacons or Wi-Fi, suddenly you've got a whole just literally millions of new data points coming in that can tell you a story and, and how do we then use that? You know, how do we take advantage of that? And that's where we really have to think about today, what, what are the, the core things we need to have, you know, in hand to make that work? Uh, and that, you know, kind of points a finger back at, at ad tech and, you know, the technology available. Uh, we, we discussed a bit uh, yesterday on this, but, you know, when you're looking at uh, the, the basics, you need to be able to measure what's happening and in what sequence. Um, and that would be through, you know, some means of attribution, and that's taking in, you know, not not into account individual channels, but that omni-channel engagement. And you know, it starts with uh, mobile, laptop, and tablet, but then it extends beyond. Um, it goes into, you know, what are these other data points that are coming in? Um, digital uh, out of home you know, being in, uh, either interactive or with beacons in it. You know, you've got shopping malls uh, down in Australia that have beacons deployed, so they're actually able to tell where people are moving and spending what time in front of what shopping malls and what front of what stores. Um, so there's the attribution side. You've got the audience side where you need to then link those engagement points down to um, individual audiences and then, you know, being able to build, um, you know, targeting segments and, you know, using the various tools out there to be able to actually assign value uh, to those individuals and then extrapolate, um, you know, look-alike activity. You know, these people look like they're doing those activities that put them in that funnel that we've identified them in. How do we then take advantage of that? And you need some form of business intelligence to be able to actually see it, act on it, and do something with it. And so, um, that, that core technology exists. Um, you've got stacks like Adobe and Google that are trying to offer all of it under one roof. Um, the reality is that nothing is, is yet working perfectly together. And so what we're trying to look at you know, from DWA's perspective is we've got a whole big picture and this perfect sort of candy land of, you know, roll the dice and things work perfectly, but actually we need to go for the lowest hanging fruit and make sure that, you know, our clients um, and everyone have, have the basics covered before worrying about um, big, the big end of uh, IoT. Yeah, of course. And I guess if you, let me take a step back for a second. So, so we're all on the same page. Can you explain what what a beacon is? Sure, sure. So a, be a beacon is just basically simply um, 
kind of like a Wi-Fi transponder, and when it uh, it, it's programmed to when you come into a certain uh, proximity of it with an app on your mobile phone, um, it will ping the beacon and um, let the beacon know that you've come to a certain distance from that. And then depending on what's programmed on the app or behind that, um, an action will then take place, uh, if you will, sort of if this, then that scenario. Um, for example, if you have an app that is um, beacon enabled, you could walk up to uh, Starbucks and without doing anything, you could earn points on your loyalty card just through purchasing simply because you walked up and the transaction was recorded. Uh, so it, it, it makes for a hands-free environment. It makes for new, new ways to communicate and engage um, that allow us to you know, take a step back uh, and automate a lot of that activity. Now, how, how do we take all this data? Because it's you know it's it's constantly coming in from you know th these devices, right? Um, and not end up with you know just a, a lot more silos. So we've got your email silo, you've got your ad serving silo, you've got your um, uh, content silo, your website silo. Now we're going to have more silos with 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 device data. How how, how do we solve for that? How do we help? How do we help marketers make sense of all this? Yeah. And, and, and that's where I think uh, what some people are coining the, the smart data, um, we, we really need to take a step back and begin asking a question saying, well, of everything that we're looking at, what is going to allow us to actually make sense out of an engagement? What is, what is valuable or um, you know, what is relevant? Uh, and what can we just ignore or throw away? or put aside and say, you know what, let's put that as a, a second or third uh, priority and let's really just look at the key pieces. Um, and I think it really needs, needs to start with uh, the key, you know, conversion areas that we're at. And, you know, it's not just about the CPA, you know, which we really stare at from a B2B perspective. It's really about, you know, what is converting at that stage of the funnel and what are we measuring that leads to success. And if that's getting into the store, measuring that someone went from that first point of engagement with the brand all the way through past purchase and became um, an advocate of the brand, it's being able to surface all the data that's going to be relevant into a single holistic view and then be able to then pinpoint and say, okay, let's run some regressions on this. Let's create some algorithms that are going to allow us to actually uh, create some targeting that really is bespoke to the audiences and, and what they're doing. Um, and that, that's really where the ad tech comes in. You've got to have, uh, you know, proper attribution. And, you know, it, it, it's that basic question, first click, last click. Uh, no, that's not the question to ask. It's what are people doing and how do we track it? And in addition, Aria, you've got to go further upstream now as we start involving partners and developers as well. So that's now something that marketers need to consume or need to consider as well as they start looking at how this data fits together is they're getting further and further upstream from an actual intent, if you will, as this ecosystem gets bigger, correct? Totally, totally, absolutely. Um, maybe what, what would be good is I can go ahead to the next slide and give an example of sort of uh, a future that's just around the corner um, so we can kind of look back on today and say, you know, to get to that point, where, what do we need to be thinking about? Because I think it it's really comes back to the age-old uh, idea of, you know, asking the right question. Um, so what we've got here is uh, technology. All of this exists today. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you've got a Fitbit Blaze. You've got the Amazon Dash, which uses voice recognition and can auto um, order uh, grocery products from Amazon delivered to you on the same day or the next day. Samsung Smart Refrigerator has got a camera pointing inside, can count what you have in the fridge, uh, how much is available, how much is left, and when you need to order. And then the Moly um, Robotic Kitchen, which can cook um, thousands of recipes which are downloaded from uh, famous chefs. It can completely uh, mimic their moves. So you get uh, chef quality, you know, five star meals coming out of your kitchen. So you're at the gym, you go to your exercise, your Fitbit Blaze counts how many calories you've burned based on the exercise. You've already programmed that you want this kind of a diet with this many calories per day. 
your Amazon orders what's missing from the fridge, and by the time you get home, your robotic kitchen has cooked it, and you're ready to eat. Um, this alone, to so many different marketing uh, just advertisers, would be incredibly um, valuable data to understand the patterns of when people are exercising, when they're not exercising, how frequently they're you know, consuming certain foods. But then you've got uh, the information that is next to this. You know, um, when are they not exercising? When, when are things not happening? You know, you know, within the refrigerator, how can we take advantage um, of all this data? And this, while these are disparate technologies that aren't linked yet, this is literally happening today. And so, you know, looking at a situation like this, how many advertisers and brands are ready for this reality? when we're not yet set up to deliver, you know, media uh, and an omni-channel presence. A lot of companies are still fighting, trying to sort out where they sit in the mobile space, you know, to app or not to app. Th these are questions that are going to be moot pretty soon. Um, and I think where, where we need to help the advertisers and, and everybody along is, you know, wh what is that unified way of approaching this, which is, you know, uh, was Chris was saying before, the, the BDE perspective, where you're looking at an ecosystem, where you're not just looking at, um, you know, the consumer side or the business and business side. And this is a great slide area because if you look at this, these would be, you know, in a large uh, consumer electronics would be considered completely different product lines. And but from a user experience point of view, the the end consumer who's experiencing this, um, it's actually a unified experience in their life. So companies need to stop looking at these as sort of discrete events being pushed out to the market. In addition, if you look at things from Fitbit to Amazon, from Amazon to Samsung, that sort of um, space in between, that's where you have to be aware that there are partner and developer communities, and they need to be invited into that data flow as well. So, so you know, when you talk about connecting the IoT dots, what does that look like? And I think that's the... Uh that's that's the real secret sauce because um, at this point in time, uh, you were mentioning before when we were thinking about media planning and designing, you know, uh, communication. It's very hard to imagine how people are going to engage with uh, with, with communication. Um, we've already got you know people sort of living either with two or three devices while they're you know consuming television or televised content. Um, you've got uh, smartwatches which give you the glance in interactivity as opposed to you know taking your smartphone and reading through full content. Um, I think it's up to us to expand to extend our uh, our reach and do you know audit and say, we need to break down the walls between marketing, sales, product, and begin looking at you know, data and looking at the customer's perspective. Um, where are they and what are they engaging in uh, and what are they not engaging in? You know, uh, I think you mentioned before, the, the focus on content and how we deploy content, where that content is going to live and how it's going to be consumed, we really need to begin spending a lot more time in that space um, as opposed to, you know, producing a 15-second TVC and then trying to cut it up for different uh, channels. Uh, this this well, webinar that's for the, existence, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. And, and that's, that's the great fear. The great fear is, as an industry, we've gotten used to the idea of integrated marketing, of being able to put these, these jigsaw puzzles together, if you will. But uh, what is happening now is if marketers are not aware of what you're talking about, they're going to wind up sending in essence, unconnected messages into each one of these channels, and it ceases to be integrated marketing and kind of becomes parallel marketing, doesn't it? Yep, yep. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that marketers had is that the traditional KPIs on media started with, you know, GRPs and TARPs and TV, um, and it was really based on panels and estimates and di digital... Uh, has yet to be able to deliver that perfect measurement. Part of it is because there's a lack of understanding of what these different technologies do. And even just the technologies of today, uh, you take an example like viewability measurement. 25 platforms, they all have a completely different measurement technology. They're throwing up discrepancies of up to 90% among them, and yet 
there's this you know push by the vendors saying you have to have verification built in. Nobody really understands it, and yet there's this kind of fear that if you don't, you're missing out on something. And that's one cost of many more costs where IoT creates more channels to diversify across the omnichannel delivery. Where do you put your money? You know, what, what are you going to spend on it? How do you make sure that things work? Well, I well, think well, the thing that I'm hearing talk. more and more about, and I want to I want to ask Chris about Chris about this is experience. So maybe to our point, maybe this can be cost per experience, and that's where we hear more and more from uh, the market. It's it's actually not about you know buying buying a, a product. It's it's having an experience with a brand, um, and in this scenario um, that we're looking at here. You can see that it's a cross brand. The cross product this experience is happening, and so how are brands going to cope with, with with this sort of multi-touch experiential world? Well, and it, it's great because Ari already mentioned the word intent, and uh, you know, intent for for especially mine, I come out of a direct marketing background. Intent means something very specific, but intent is actually becoming a little bit more complicated, complex term in that, you know, what is your intent for your developer community? Well, the intent for the developer community is to create enthusiasm and uplift behind your technology. And the intent behind that is to get your partners involved. And the intent for them is to help you come to market in a more efficient and cost-effective fashion. So we have to think of it not just in terms of, did we create an intent to create a sale? But did we create intent that lifted the entire ecosystem? And uh, that's where Aria's conversations about the talk, about the data, about that cost per experience, being able to understand, okay, that cost per experience for developers and for your partner marketing and for the end consumer are different. And um, you you really need to be aware of what the intent is in each one of those and yet be able to stitch them together in a consistent fashion so you as a marketer have a consistent and single view of the truth when it comes to looking at your intent across that ecosystem. Yeah. And you, you see companies like, um, and I think they get hyped up a bit, but the likes of Uber, Airbnb, uh, kind of sharing economy where, you know, there's not actually a single piece of uh, inventory held um, and, and the, the systems are built around uh, platforms. 100%. It's not about, um, you know, the, the logistics of delivery. It's about uh, being able to measure uh, and really dig deep into the data and say, okay, how can I measure performance and where can I tweak it? And uh, I think we need to get to the point where, as marketers, we're looking at uh, not channels, but, you know, that experience and what is building that experience and what is actually going to be adding on to that pile so that it pushes them over the line to purchase. And then understanding, okay, this individual did this. Can we then begin to, to extrapolate what are the key big pushes and, and channel agnostic that got them over the line at those points in time when the decision was being made? Right, and and there are so many channels now, and I think you have that in your next uh, next slide. How many uh, how many different places you can now be telling that story? Yeah, yep, and this is. You know, it, it, it is an example, and this is sort of, if, if you were to say where to start, you know, we've got the three screens. But Internet radio, great place. You can measure engagement with ads. You've got OTT, um, you know, over the top. Uh, Netflix, uh, over in Australia, we've got about four or five competing platforms. You've got Hulu, et cetera. Um, you've got the likes of Digital Out of Home, which, you know, is, you know, First and foremost, a measurement device, but also you know delivering tailored delivery to individuals, and then um, watches and wearables, and the mix and match of all of these things allows for both tracking and then delivery of content. I'll give you a live example. Uh, right now in the U.S., you've got um, a new uh, sort of radio company that's coming out that Spotify's invested in that's looking to challenge the um, elevator music business. And so I walk in with my Spotify app playing, or my Spotify app just on my phone, 
I enter an elevator, I can receive a targeted message over the radio in the elevator. And I can also just simply measure whether or not people are coming and going in elevators. And so the precision of just measurement of people's movement and activity and what they're doing and how they're doing it, it just adds that much more to the story. Uh, you know, back to your point before, it's kind of like you're trying to filling in those gaps and those blanks where you just don't know where people are. And it just gives us that much more opportunity to be, you know, more precise and give people the kind of communication that they want. Well, it sounds like a brave new connected world to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hope, hopefully Wait, so. I've, heard, I've heard that before. <laughs> and so it's, it's, I, I think this is, is, is a great a great dialogue and questions are, are, are coming in, so I'll ask them as, as they come in. But if we move to, to, to the next slide. I mean, I guess the, the, the question is, um, I mean, how, 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 do we get, how do we get started? Um, I mean, that, that's, if I go back one here, yeah, I mean, how, how, how do we get this thing going? There's a lot of people sort of asking that, that, that question. What, what's next? Um, uh, as Christopher said earlier, they've got a, uh, this big jigsaw puzzle, but with no image to, to know what they're building. How do they get started? What do you, Christopher, what do you think? Well, I, I think to go forward, you first have to go back a little bit. And I think, you know, the one conversation we're hearing consistently uh, from these, these companies that have, you know, went to bed a, a pl product and woke up as a platform um, is they don't understand sort of where to kind of, where's the shallow end of the pool, okay? So if 60% if of our audience is planning to start an IoT project and 42% of them are doing it to figure out IoT, where is a cost-effective place to sort of look at your media plan, look at how you talk to the outside world, understand the intent into your ecosystem, and then also understand what the drivers are within your own company. So, for instance, there's people in your technology groups now, large companies, who are making technology decisions today that 18 months from now are going to be affecting marketing. The marketing is not going to find out about that until another 18 months. That's a bad place to be in a connected world. So one of the things that we're working with a lot of Fortune 500 companies doing right now is helping these companies that have been in a product world move to a platform world and the shallow end of the pool is, how does your technology talk to the outside world? Are you a, a big stack that talks to platforms? Are you going to crack open a bunch of APIs and reveal those to developers? And if you're going to do that, how are you going to build your developer community? Uh, what resources are you going to give them? What are the implications of having, in essence, an open source group of developers writing to your stack? And here's the thing for companies to understand is this can be an exercise, a completely internal exercise. You can build this whole program and never actually release it to a developer community. But going through the rigor of understanding how all these pieces of the ecosystem fit together within your own company will allow you to be informed and make better decisions on the, how you communicate that outside. And so, you know, we, we joke about the, the, the fake developer program, and it's really just an exercise internally to understand if I'm going to be in a connected world, what does that mean? What are the implications? And how can I roll in these parts of my company and get them invested in marketing who haven't been so before? And that's sort of a shallow end of the pool where people can start understanding if I'm becoming an ecosystem, what are those moving pieces within my own company? Because if you don't understand that within your own company, you're never going to have a chance to connect to the outside world. Yeah, no, I think that's that's um uh, really, really good, good point, and sort of bring, brings it home. So we've got we've got a few few questions I want to sort of uh, get get out there and 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 get you the reaction to. So, sorry, one one question that 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 that's come in is is really from an advertiser point of view. So, what should advertisers do right now to prepare for the sort of coming wave of IoT solutions? Yeah, I. I I really think the first thing you need to do is, is look in the mirror. Um, I, you know, Chris kind of alluded to it in the last, in the last one, but um, if anyone has seen the latest uh, Rocky movie, Creed, uh, you know, uh, Creed is sitting there looking in the mirror, and, you know, Rocky says, your biggest opponent is right there looking back at you. You know, and I think the, the, the advertisers really need to ask the hard question and say, are we allowing ourselves to internally see everything that's happening across and among the departments that are touching consumer engagement? Um, is it possible that 
you know, we're missing uh, internal signals that are right there under our noses that we're not allowing to, to see, um, you know, and, and really sort of identify where those gaps are um, and then begin filling those in. And, you know, some of it will take either, you know, investment in technology internally, um, you know, working with agencies like DWA to say, well, you know, how do we begin plugging those gaps um, and, and opening up, uh, sort of taking the band-aids off the wounds and sort of <laughs> letting everything out into the open. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once you're there, it's kind of going out and beginning and testing and, you know, allowing for knowing that, you, you know, Chris said earlier, people just want to put 6% want to go into IoT because they just want to want to try it. And, you know, before going into the Internet of Things, let's go into the Internet of Today and really ask the question, are the guys that are doing the, the engagement out in our social media owned platforms, are we having the same conversations we are in our direct marketing or in our display media or in our offline media? And how do we measure that? before getting into talking about wearables and talking about beacons and, you know, other data points that um, are around the corner. Yeah, well, that's, that, that's great. And I, I want to I wanna wrap it up on, on, on that last question. And, and, and really, really just um, want to thank uh, both you guys. Really insightful uh, information. Um, the slides will be um, available after the recording in a few minutes. Um, so you can download the slides. Also download the audience survey that Chris, Christopher mentioned. Um, but I think it, it, we really encourage you to have that conversation internally with your customers, with your partners, because we're all learning together. And you know what we're trying to do here is to sort of give you another nugget of information uh, to, to sort of help you kind of move forward as you think about this brave new world. It's exciting, it's scary, but as Christopher said, we've, we've got all the pieces, but we don't know what it's going to look like. So again, thank you both so much for uh, being my guest today. Uh, and again, thanks for, for the live and for the future on demand audience. We look forward to seeing you here again next month for our monthly webinar series. Uh, and have a great day, no matter where you are in the world. Okay, everybody, all the best. Thank you very much, James. Yep, thank you.